You know, again, in 10 minutes, it's a little bit difficult. Um, what do you talk about the shoulder? Well, there's a lot of things in the shoulder to talk about. Um, we're going to hit on some of the common diagnoses, and then I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, rotator cuff uh, because there's going to be some later, you know, specific rotator cuff. But there's going to be talks on total shoulder replacement, reverse replacement, and obviously those are with arthritic conditions of the shoulder and the operative management. But, you know, it was uh, 10 minutes not enough to talk about every non uh, operative condition. So we're going to kind of hit on some of the rotator cuff and, and see how we do. So, you know, what's the relevance? Um, you might feel like this red truck sometimes. Someone comes in with shoulder pain. Is it the neck? Is it the shoulder? There's a lot of things going on in the shoulder. So we're going to give you some information. Hopefully you don't make the wrong turn or uh, be caught hanging by some, some wrong information. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about anatomy, symptoms, exams, some uh, diagnostic tests, and some treatments. So the bones, uh, and I think Dr. Johansson will probably hit on some of this as well, but the scapula, the shoulder blade, glenoid, the socket, a chromium uh, bone up on top, uh, the clavicle and the coracoid, all of these combine to have shoulder conditions and shoulder pain. Uh, some more of the anatomy that uh, I'm sure we'll see some great MRIs of some of this as well, but uh, you know, cartilage, rotator cuff, bursa, deltoid, and then the bony structures we talked about. So there's a lot of normal variants, and this comes into play when we get MRIs and someone comes in and says, well, my MRI says that I have a labral tear, and they've got something totally different. So not all of the, the anatomical um, deficiencies or abnormalities on an MRI translates into what their symptoms are. There's a lot of the normal variants of the biceps, which is, this is a, a, an example of uh, the superior labrum a sublabral foramen hole that, you know, we'll see this person, you know, they may have this uh, sublabral hole, but look at all this synovitis and a little bit of arthritis. So, you know, what, uh, what patients come in with their MRI doesn't exactly mean uh, that's what their symptoms are. Um, and a rotator cuff partial tear like this and a superior labral tear may not be a, a big deal in most of the population unless you're dealing with this population. And obviously these are arthroscopic pictures, so this person wasn't treated non-operatively for this. This is what was done, which is a debridement. Um, and so you have to take your, your patient and their activity levels into account and what the demands are. And a lot of things can be treated non-operatively in the right setting. So shoulder symptoms, uh, pain with overactivity, do they have weakness, do they have night pain, do they have stiffness? Two things that, that lead to stiffness pretty easily, arthritis or adhesive capsulitis, frozen shoulder, compared to the other side all the time. Age of the patient, activity levels. So here's some shoulder conditions. And again, I can't talk about all of these, but these are the most common shoulder conditions that we deal with and see every day. And patients may or may not have imaging studies, but with a good history and a good physical exam um, and just uh, some simple x-rays, you can start to you know, categorize these patients real quickly as to where they fall. So physical exam, what's their motion compared to the other side? Some of them might have decent motion, but it's significantly less than their other side. Um, specifically, you know, abduction, external inter internal rotation compared to the other side, or lay them down and compare their rotation to the other side. You'll pick up a subtle adhesive capsulitis that you otherwise may not notice if you're just examining that shoulder. So range motion is important. Pain to palpation, where do they hurt? All of these things are kind of classic. The biceps is classic. You know, my, my shoulder hurts right here. Different than rotator cuff pain. Different than bursitis pain. Um, specific impingement tests. Pain with strength testing. Is it good strength but pain? Or pain and weakness? Um, and specific weakness of specific rotator cuffs. So the physical exam and the history is real important. You can start getting an idea of exactly uh, you know, what it is so you don't feel like that red truck all the time with shoulder pain. So some of the specific tests, specific x-rays, we typically get four views of the x-ray, uh, four views of the shoulder that, that shows us specifically what their glenohumeral joint space is, do they have any high riding. This one, uh, axillary lateral, you can see this relationship, any um, early arthritis or thinning, you can pick up um, osochromial on this view. Um, this is uh, an outlet view that you can see the morphology of the acromion, and then this is an AC view here to pick up uh, specific AC joint arthritis findings. MRIs, these are a little better uh, newer MRIs than Dr. Hersig's. I think his were from the 70s, but um, <laughs> these are a little bit better, and Dr. Reeder talked more about you know, MRIs. 
These are some, you know, classic, uh, you know, paralabral cysts, labral pathology, and then, you know, you can even do MRA, MR arthrograms, all right? And you can find even more specific cartilage issues with MR arthrogram, you know, specific slap tears that you may not see with a regular MRI. So this, uh, you know, picture of a rotator cuff tear. Now, are we going to treat this non-operatively? Some people would argue, yeah, you can treat rotator cuff tears non-operatively. Um, obviously, this one was not treated non-operatively. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the studies and uh, how to, to classify who you could or should treat non-operatively and uh, when the appropriate time is to start considering a, a, a better course or a different course. So non-operative treatment. Um, do they have associated symptoms? Do they have bursitis? Do they have AC joint problems? Do they have biceps problems? Do they have slap tear? Are they the right age? You know, if you have a, a, a 45 and older year old person that you're really concerned about their slap tear on their MRI, you're barking up the wrong tree most times. So put all of these things in conjunction with their age, their activity level, their symptoms, and their physical exam, um, and you won't get steered wrong by what they're coming with an MRI that, that has a specific finding on it. So um, physical therapy, mainstay of treatment for a lot of these. Um, cortisone injection, judiciously not, you know, 15, 20 cortisone injections. I'll show you a picture of someone that recently had that last week that I had to fight with to get it fixed. Um, Anti-inflammatories, you know, obviously the cautions of GI uh, side effects and uh, renal side effects with anti-inflammatories. I want to remind patients about that all the time. Activity modification. Um, you know, people who have gone to the gym historically and have AC joint problems, and you just ask them what their, their workout routines are, and they talk about their military press and their shoulder press and everything else, and you maybe do a cortisone injection for their AC joint arthritis, and you have them, hey, I want you to go to the gym, but don't do anything above shoulder level and eliminate your pull downs behind the neck and eliminate your military press and your shoulder press above shoulder level, and three months later, their shoulder feels fine. So um, these are all really the mainstay of treatments for a lot of these conditions. And then the question is, okay, so you've done this non-operatively, the patient on your good physical exam has noticeable weakness specifically of one of the rotator cuffs, most commonly the supraspinatus, and then you get an MRI, and then depending on what the MRI shows, it's a, a, a moderate grade tear or high grade tear or full thickness rotator cuff tear. Um, doing minimal cortisone injections for someone like that with a rotator cuff and trying some physical therapy, not too excessively in my opinion, um, because they're either going to respond or they're not within a month or two, and having uh, an option to fix them if this is failing, I think is a good way to go about rotator cuff uh, issues. Now, we can plug in shoulder arthritis, and all of these things also apply to shoulder arthritis. You're going to hear some talks on you know, total and reverse shoulder replacements. But I would say that in the arthritis category, you can use these a little bit longer without any long-term detrimental effects as opposed to the rotator cuff. So, you know, the idea of the rotator cuff, and I'll present a couple of studies, the rotator cuff really doesn't heal itself, and there's a significant risk of tear progression. And so I tell patients, tears go from, you know, tendinopathy, tendinosis, which is normal age degeneration of the rotator cuff, you start to get partial tears, moderate grade turn into high grade, high grade turn into full thickness tears, small full thickness tears turn into large full thickness tears, then there's retraction, then there's atrophy. Unlike other muscles in the body, atrophy in the rotator cuff is irreversible. So, you know, I tell patients that maybe have atrophy with a large retracted rotator cuff tear, we can make your pain better, but you have a higher re-tear rate and you have a, a higher chance that this is going to fail. So a higher failure rate and re-tear rate uh, and if they have atrophy, they may not regain all their strength. And oftentimes they don't have 100% of their strength, but their pain is usually better, so they can sleep at night. So you want to try to recognize the people that are failing this in the rotator cuff situation before they get too many excessive cortisone injections, because then you start to affect our real repair capability and their long-term outcome. Different than arthritis. So rotator cuff. Quality of Life Index predicts the outcome of non-operative treatment of patients with a chronic rotator cuff tear. All right? So this uh, looked at 93 patients with full thickness rotator cuff tear. 75% of them were treated successfully non-operatively. Um, 
a predictor. If they were successful at three months, then it was pretty good success at two years. But an 89% maintain outcome at two years. So this is an example, you know, one study that says, hey, these people with a chronic rotator cuff tear, we rehabbed and they did physical therapy, they actually did pretty well. But you want, not everybody falls in that category. Tendon repair compared with physiotherapy and the treatment, rotator cuff tears. A randomized controlled study is 103 cases. So, look at this group. Primary repair, they had better outcome. Physical therapy group had increasing tear size when they followed them. 25% of the physical therapy group of patients, they opted for a secondary repair and they didn't do as well. The primary repairs did better than the secondary repairs. So this falls into kind of the, the old dogma, you know, when I was in training 20 years ago, well, you've got a small rotator cuff, with small rotator cuff tear. We don't repair small rotator cuffs because we did them all open. We didn't do it through the scope. So it was a, a much more labor intensive ordeal. So we just gave them cortisone and cortisone and cortisone. And then guess what? Oh, now you've got a big tear, so now we're going to fix it. Well, guess what? We have, we ha because of our dogma then, we steered them to a poor outcome because they had maybe a year or two or three of cortisone injections. The tear became small to big, retracted, and atrophic, and then we repaired them. And then we said, well, they don't do that great with a rotator cuff repair. So that's why we don't want to fix small ones because they don't do that well. We had the logic all wrong. When we started learning how to do it arthroscopically in the last you know, 15 to 20 years, now we recognize if we get them sooner, they do better. Um, and so this is, this is a, a recent study, 2014, that shows some people do okay with physical therapy, but the people that don't and then get repairs don't do as well. So keep that in mind. Tear progression. Outcome of non-operative treatment of symptomatic rotator cuff tears monitored by MRI. Um, so 2009 study, 59 patients followed by MRI. 17 progressed, less than 60 years of age. 54% progressed if they were greater than 60. 24% of the fourth thickness rotator cuff tears developed atrophy. This is irreversible. If you are watching someone with a rotator cuff tear and they become a larger tear, uh, retracted, atrophic, when those patients now go to have a repair, they won't do as well. So find those people early, keep track of them, do an MRI yearly if you're gonna follow them, don't just do cortisones and four years later they come and see us and, and we say, well, did you have an MRI? Yeah, four years ago, but it was just a partial tear. And now they have a big retracted atrophic tear. They won't do as well. So here's my example from this week. This lady has lupus. She has seen her excellent rheumatologist, if there's any rheumatologist here. But she had three years of 20 plus cortisone injections. She had an MRI three years ago that showed a moderate grade partial rotator cuff tear and this is what it is now. This is all very, this is like tissue paper right here. Okay, the bulk of her rotator cuff is here, here, delaminated, here's a layer, here's a layer, here's a layer. This is her labrum, glenoid, uh, humerus, all right? So, so this was a very labor intensive, not that great of quality. She's on Plaquenil, she's on prednisone, she's had 20 cortisone injections, and she's 39. Um, and she can't sleep and she has atrophy. So this person would have been better three years ago getting this repaired as opposed to where she is now because she has a higher retear rate and she's not gonna get all of her strength back, but she'll have pain relief because we were able to get this all put down if we get it to heal in the face of her you know, immunosuppressive drugs. So you're gonna hear more about uh, rotator cuff repairs. Listen to the history symptoms, consider their age, trauma, x-rays, specific exam to evaluate their condition, judicious use of cortisone injections, consider MRI if they have weakness of the rotator cuff. My opinion is if they have weakness, get an MRI before you start doing cortisone injections because you'll cover up their pain for a while if you don't. And consider uh, referral when in doubt. Thank you.